we love you so very much. You are so good. We are thankful to be here today. Father, thank you for everybody who is here. Father, give them a special blessing. Father, and please go with Logan as he's going back home right now with a uh, ser serious head injury. Father, from playing football, Father, we're asking that you bring some healing to him. Father, we're going to stand on that and we're going to believe for that. Father, we will have faith to believe that. Father, we ask that you increase his faith as well. And also, be with us today as we know that you will. Help us to understand your truth and in your word and your doctrines. And we love you so very much. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Okay, today we're going to be continue, continuing with part two of seven Christian doctrines. We started that last Sunday, so if you were not here last Sunday and you would like to see what that message was about, please get with me or if you have access to my YouTube channel, part one is up, or if you know how to get on Facebook and you know how to get to the church page, it's on there as well uh, if you want to get caught up. But today we are continuing with part two and we're going to start with four eschatology The end times, or the study of the end times, and end events, what to expect in the rapture, okay? So the signs of the end times is one of the hottest topics in Christianity, uh, the study of eschatology and the rapture, and everybody's interested, what's going to happen, right? I don't know if you're like me, but that topic interests me because I believe that we are in the end times. Matter of fact, in the Bible it says it was already in the end times then. So in the New Testament it, it records that if they were already in the end times. And how much more 2,000 years later are we in the end times? Right. How much closer are we? And as we read this next scripture here in a second, we will see how close we should be. But it is essential to know where we sit as far as end times. We need to know what to expect as Jesus' arrival nears. And we also need to know how we need to position ourselves or better position ourselves as we see that day approaching. As we talked about briefly last Sunday, the scripture says, as you see that day approaching, assemble yourselves or gather yourselves together all the more. All the more we need to be coming to church and coming together as the herd of Christ. Amen. The sheep the, the, the sheep that we are. Because we are a herd. And we are supposed to assemble ourselves together because there is protection in that. <clears throat> there is protection. Can God protect you when you're outside the herd? Of course. But there is better protection when we are assembled together. So as much as it is possible with us, we need to make it a priority to be in church. Right? That's what I touched on last Sunday. And I want to make it clear right now so there's no misunderstanding. If you cannot be here, that's 100% understandable. If you're sick, there's a death in the family, you have to go take care of business or do something, that's understandable. But if you just wake up and you say, uh, I don't feel like going, that's not good enough. Right? Because Jesus didn't have that when He was going to the cross. Uh, I don't feel like going to the cross. Right? We need to make it a priority to go to church because that's what the Bible says to do. Right? Yep. We need it. It's not something we can just pass on. Oh, well, I want to do something else. And no, make going to church a priority. Priority number one. So if you were upset or you got offended last Sunday, I was not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I am just trying to get it implanted in our minds that we need to make going to church a priority. It doesn't need to be something that we can just pass on. Right? I mean, if, you, if you're going to another church, that's okay. If you all decide that you don't like this or what, what we're doing here, but go to a church. Go somewhere. Right? Because the more that we get by ourselves, the easier it is for the devil to come at us. Especially if you're not a good student of the Word already, and Sundays is normally the only day that you get the Word in you, now you've gone two weeks without the Word. And three. And four. 
or how many ever Sundays you miss because you're just not feeling like going, right? Like I said, that's not the kind of attitude we need to have. We need to say, I get to go to church. Yeah. I, it's, a, it's a privilege. It's an honor that God has bestowed upon us. Like I was saying earlier about our veterans, they have given us a chance to have these freedoms. Yeah. And like I mentioned last Sunday, there's some countries that don't have that. They don't get to go to church like we do. But over here, we take it for granted. Over there, if they had that freedom, you better believe every time those doors were open, they would be coming. Yeah. Every chance they get. Yeah. And some of them would probably fight past the sickness to get here. Right? Okay. Now, I'm not trying to make guilt you into coming if you're sick, okay? I'm not trying to do that. But I'm just trying to get us on the same page and the same wavelength of how we need to consider going to church, right? Not as an option, right? Oh, well, i got something better to do today, so I'm going to do that. But going to church is a priority, right? Number one. All right, I'm off my soapbox again. <laughs> Let's go to Luke 21. 25 through 36. So y'all bear with me. Kind of long. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. We've seen some of that already. Yes. And on the earth, distress of nations. We noticed that. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. We've noticed that, haven't we? Men's hearts failing them from fear in the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, see we've already started seeing them begin to happen, haven't we? When we've seen them begin to happen, Look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. Isn't that awesome? When we begin to see these things take place in the world around us, and I believe we have, anytime something crazy happens, oh, it's the end times, right? Everybody's like, ooh, that's the end times. We need to lift our heads and say, Jesus, come. I see you coming. I know you're coming. My redemption draws near because Jesus draws near to us in the rapture. We're going to get to that in a second. He tells us this, when you see these signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, look up because your, your redemption draws near. Keep this in mind as I explain some of these signs in a minute. Then He spoke to them in a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will will by no means pass away. So he spoke to them this parable. And it was talking about a fig tree. Now from what I've gathered, most scholars agree that when Israel became a nation in 1948, this was that sign fulfilled. That means the generation that witnessed that take place will by no means pass away before the coming of Jesus. So let's put a number on it. 1948, how old can somebody be? Let's say 120. Now, we're not too far away from that. Okay? Let's just say somebody was around 13 years old whenever they witnessed Israel become a nation. Well, they can't live too much longer. You know? They had to have been able to witness that takes place. And then they'll be alive still when Jesus comes back. So... We're getting closer and closer is what I'm trying to say. That gap is narrowing and narrowing. 
Each year is a year closer to Jesus' return. Thank you, Jesus. And as we see that day approaching, what should we do? Abide. Maybe I didn't get, stay on my soap book, soap, well, we soap box to too long. We need to go to church. Gather together. We need to gather together as often as we can, as feasibly as possible. If one day you wake up and just say, well, I have a headache. I don't feel like going to church. Or I'm mad today. Or I have anxiety today. Or I'm feeling depressed today. That's all the more reason to go to church. Amen. Don't go away from the hospital. Right? If you need healing, don't, leave, don't say, well, I don't need the hospital. You go to where you know you can get that healing or deliverance or help, or comfort, or encouragement, or love that you're lacking. You don't run away from it because that's what the devil wants you to do. Yeah. He wants you to say, oh, well, I could, I got them, you know. Oh, that's all I needed to do. I made them feel a little bad today, so now they ain't going. No, we need to fight past his attacks. Be strong in the Lord. Be steadfast in the Lord. Know that this is the place to go, right? Let it be so, Lord, help us. Then verse 34, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life, that that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray. Always that you may be counted worthy to escape. Don't you want to escape? Yeah, yes. Lord, when you're coming back, I want to get out of here. All these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man, I want to go. When He comes back, I want to go. Yeah, yeah. I don't know when it is, but when He comes, I'm going. Right? Yeah, yeah. I might be high-fiving some of y'all in there as we're going. <laughs> but I'm going to be doing it. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Now I want to go ahead and tell you, some of you may disagree, but I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Now there's somehow there's so many different versions, and that's okay. If you believe that, it's not a heaven or hell issue. Alright, that's just we don't know. Alright, if it's something else, well then okay. But I just believe that the best evidence points to a pre-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. So that's from where I'm coming. If you believe something different, power to you, that's okay, I'm not mad at you. Don't be mad at me, alright? Just listen and <laughs> nod your head or shake your head no or whatever you gotta do. But 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-11 But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. He's saying I don't have to write to you because you already know what's going on. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, meaning unexpectedly. We won't know. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and, then, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as a thief. He's saying it's going to come as a thief in the night, to everybody in this world, but not to us, because we know what to look for. We know the signs. When we see those crazy things happening, we say, oh, it's the end times. Other people say, oh, well, that's just a natural event that takes place, or every so hundred years or so, some crazy thing happens, and they explain it away, and coincidence, coincidence, and, you know, they have no understanding of this. But we see it for what it is, right? We see these crazy events take place and say, man, Jesus is coming, right? That's how we look at it. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, basically being blinded to what's going on, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, 
but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are we awake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Now check this out. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Comfort each other. And are you comforted if you have to go through the trials and tribulations? Is that a comfort to you? It's not to me. That's a disappointment. Man, why? What's the point? I'm already saved. I'm already on your side. Why do I got to go through this tribulation stuff? Why do I got to experience your wrath that He's going to be pouring out? He says we're not appointed to wrath, right? So it makes the most sense that He's going to snatch us out of there before all that takes place. That's just what makes the most logical sense to me. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. He's going to be pouring out His wrath and having, allowing this tribulation period to test those who have not yet made their commitment to the Lord. He's going to give them one last chance. I'm going to throw this on the whole world and whoever comes to me then can be saved as well. But nevertheless, He doesn't need to do that with those who are already saved, right? right. We're already on His side. Amen to that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm on your side. Thank you. But He says, I will keep you from that hour of trial. He's going to keep it away from us. Because it would be redundant, right? To test those who have already passed the test. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Let no one deceive you, for that day will not come unless there's a falling away. Now there's two renderings here. There's the apostasy of the church where people will turn away from God. A big falling away because people fall away all the time. But there will be a falling away. There will be people who are exposed, who have claimed to be Christian all their life, they will finally walk away from the church because they were never among us anyway. They were never a part of us anyway. But then let's see what it says in verses 6 and 7. And now you know what is restraining, that He may be revealed in His own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. It says there that the, the lawless one cannot even be revealed until the one who is restraining is taken out of the way. Now there's also two renderings here. And either one applies to us. One rendering is the church is the one that is restraining. Okay, I'm more of the camp of the Holy Spirit. That's the other view. That it's the Holy Spirit that is restraining the lawless one from being revealed. And the only way, either one, pick one, whatever one you like, the church or the Holy Spirit still applies to us. Unless he's taken out of the way, the Antichrist can't even be revealed. Which triggers the seven years of that tribulation period. Yes, it's only the last half that actually is tribulation. But nevertheless, there's a seven year period that takes place. He can't even be revealed until that Holy Spirit, or us, is taken out of the way. And if the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way, guess who's riding along with Him? We are. Because He's attached to us. He said He will never leave us nor forsake us. And if He's inside of us, guess who's riding with Him on that trip to heaven? We are. And then if it's the church that is taken out of the way, well, either way, we're gone. So thank you, Lord. So from my understanding and what the Bible says and what a lot of scholars say, obviously, this makes the most sense. If you believe something else, power to you, that's okay, I ain't mad at you. But keep studying because I draw comfort in the fact that I get to go. Amen. Right? Keep looking it up. Alright? We'll go ahead and move on to baptisms now. Number five. Y'all see that? See that nice little picture up there? Randy put that up there. 
Yeah, that's she did my PowerPoints last night. Everybody give her a round of applause. She did good. Thank you, Lord. I didn't have to do that. When she does it, she makes it all nice and pretty. When I do it, it's just kind of just the words in the background, you know? Just get it done. Yeah, I just kind of get it done because I'm going to tell you right now, I don't like doing PowerPoints, okay? But I do them. Well, thank you for doing them. Yeah, but thankfully y'all got a, a spruced up version today because Randy did it for me. All right, so baptisms. Now that sounds like a strange word, right? Baptisms. There's more than one baptism in the Word of God. Not just you were baptized, you were baptized, you were baptized, you were baptized. But there's two different types. One of natural, which is the water, and then another of the Spirit. See, we sometimes we focus, every time we hear the word baptized, we think water. But that's not the case. you got to be careful whenever you're setting up doctrines that you make sure that you get the right understanding correct about what the word is saying and what baptism it's actually talking about. Let's go to Hebrews 6, 1-3. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will be this we will do if God permits. So he's saying, once we get get all this down, once we've figured all this out, sorted it all out, got it right, okay, this is the right doctrine. Now let's move on to more meteor issues. Let's not be so focused on the most elementary principles, but let's go on and continue. But nevertheless it's Always good to have a refresher course in understanding why we believe what we believe and what is true doctrine. So let's go to Acts 11, 15 through 17. Let me uh, naturally baptize my throat real quick. <laughs> and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. So then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See right there. He's showing a clear distinction. John did him. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now that's what shows true salvation right there. If you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit come and dwell inside of you, that shows that you are saved. Now, I've seen many people who have said, yeah, I went and got water baptized, but they weren't really saved. Water has no supernatural effect when you get all the way underneath it that it somehow miraculously saves you. No, it is only when that Holy Spirit baptizes you that you can be saved. Some don't agree with that, but that's how the Word of God portrays it. Okay? Yes, we are to go get water baptized. Because in that process of being water baptized, He could supernaturally baptize you with the Holy Spirit as well. But He also won't do that on somebody who is just out there pretending. Right? Oh, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to get water baptized so everybody thinks that I'm a Christian so I can walk around and get things that I want from them. You know what? Typically, when you join a church, there's going to be people who are generous, who are giving in nature. And maybe if they think that I'm a part of them, they'll give me some money. Right? Or they'll do something for me. They'll take care of me. So they go and get water baptized, but they're not really wanting to live for God because when they go home, they do all the evil things that they've always done. There was no spiritual baptism that took place that was a changing a rearranging of one's mind and one's actions and one's words. That didn't take place. The spiritual baptism is what we all need. Amen. If therefore God gave them the same gift as He gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I, that I could withstand God. Here we 
he is making a distinction between water baptism and spiritual baptism. And the spiritual baptism is what saves you. So make no mistake, because there are churches that do believe that you have to be water baptized to be saved. But in this instance, these people were hearing Peter speak about God and were moved to true belief. They believed and God said, Boom! Spiritually baptized. They received the Holy Spirit and thus became saved. And then, and then Peter was like, well, who am I to forbid water now? So he did go and baptize them with the water, but nevertheless, they were walking around as saved individuals before they ever touched the water. Because it's the Spirit that saves. The water can be a vehicle that God uses to do the saving. He can do that. But it is not the thing that does the saving. It's the blood of Christ. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. When you believe on Him, what He did for us on that cross, and when you associate salvation to any other thing besides that, you take away from what He did. Amen. Well, look what I did. I went and got in water, so now I'm saved. It don't work that way. You'll get saved if you truly believe on what He did. That's right. Now, you might get saved on your deathbed. You sure might. You might say, God, I've lived a sinful life. I, I know I can't go get water baptized, but I believe in you. I know what you did, and I know you can take that sin away. Do you think God's going to take away salvation from him just because he can't go get dipped in water? Yeah. No. That takes away from what Jesus Christ did. That's right. And I ain't going to say anything takes away from that. Now, if you have the means and you can, go get water baptized because that is what he tells us to do. But I ain't going to ever say that that's more important than what he did. Amen. Right? That's right. Let's go on here. We're going to go to number six, church order. Now, women don't get mad at me. <laughs> women are not allowed to be pastors or teachers over men. I will get to the scripture on that in a second. Gifts still are at work and must be done in proper order in church. And there is the, the process of laying on of hands and there is an importance to having pastors, elders, and deacons in the church. Alright, let's go to 1 Timothy 2, 11-14. Like I said, women, do not be mad at me. I love you very much. I've preached on this before, and for some reason people thought I hated women. (laughs) This is not the truth. This is what the Bible says. I am just reading what the Bible says. Everybody got that? Everybody understand? Brandon did not write this passage in the Bible, okay? 1 Timothy 2, 11-14. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now, Brandon did not write that, but Brandon does agree with that because it is in the Bible. So therefore, we all must agree with it as well, right? Amen. Not pick and choose, not saying, well, God might allow, or my feelings say, or my opinion says, or me and God have a special understanding because there's not another man over here, so I can be a pastor now. No, the Bible says not for that to take place. God will make other arrangements. Okay? I've heard many women pastors say, and I do quotes because they're not really pastors because God says they're not to do that. So therefore they are living in sin. Therefore they are doing things that are contrary to the Word of God. I've heard them say there wasn't a pastor, there was not a man around, so I had to step up and take that position. Well, did you apply for another man to come? Did you do an Indeed post? Did you do a search? There's a lot of ways that you can get a man to fulfill that position that God has set for men to fulfill. Now, let me just say for a minute, I love women, okay? I married one, I have uh, many women in my life that I love very much, we play dominoes all the time, we have a great time, all right? There's many women in this church that I love, all of y'all women, I love you. 
I'm not trying to be mean, but there is a position that you have, and it is not to be a pastor. You have other positions that are very important that you need to fill. God may have made you an encourager, a comforter, one that is supposed to show more love, right? A helper. There are many positions that are good for you women to take. But He has not called you to be a pastor. And that's okay. There's things that women can do that men cannot do. Y'all can have babies. Men can't do it. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we pray, well, God, maybe you have a special understanding for me that I can be uh, give birth to a baby. No, no, that's craziness. You need to be a man. All right? So, women, you have specific roles that you can do. Own them. But don't try to do something that God tells you not to do. Right? Right. So, again, let me say it again. I'm not trying to be mean, and I love you. Okay? Love you too. All right, good. And check this out. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. So there was an order. God formed Adam first. It wasn't Eve that was formed first. God formed Adam first for a reason. Right? And in the Bible, we see that God is a he. Is, don't we? Yes. We see that. So God set it up that way on purpose. Not trying to be mean, not trying to be hurtful or anything like that, but God had a specific order. Alright? Then it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. He's taking it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. He's saying... The woman was able to be deceived first. Adam knew what was going on. The woman got trapped up in her emotions. Women, can y'all be honest? Y'all get into some emotions sometimes, yes. right? That's right. All right. We all agree we're not making things up. Put the stones down for a second. All right? Y'all don't try to jump me in the parking lot. Y'all agree that y'all can get emotional. And that's how God made you, though. He gave you extra emotions so that you would see into situations that men would probably be too more uh, harsh on. Y'all have a little bit more leniency in things and a little bit more finesse, let me just say that. Guys, we're kind of more direct, more logical approach. We take care of business. Oh, you're crying. Well, get up, stand up. Come on, let's go. we got to do this. You know, women are like, hey, let me take care of you. Got to call and settle down for a second. He's hurt over here. He needs a band aid. He needs some lemongrass on his knees, you know? <laughs> Miss Julie, she, she saw my knee was giving out yesterday. She said, here, take this and put it on your knees. You need to take care of that. <laughs> Guys were just like, come on, stop being a wuss. Come on, let's take care of this. Let's do this. Come on. Women, well, they kind of see a little differently than we do. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. God gave you that for a reason. But sometimes you can get overly emotional and that can cause some problems, right? Guys can be overly direct and overly logical about things and that can cause problems too. But nevertheless, there is a specific order that God has placed in the church that He wants us to agree with and follow. Right? When you're a woman and you see that passage... Don't take it as a slight. Don't take it as something of, of offense or to be upset about. Take it as, okay, well, that's fine. I will own that. Let a man run it. Man, that's some stuff I don't even want to have to deal with. Because exactly. trust me, there's some stuff with being a pastor that you know can be very stressful and women might be overly stressed about it. Right? Right. So he gave that position for a man for a reason. Not to be mean. Everybody fine with that? Amen. Nobody's mad at me. Good. Whew. Lord, I got through that. Thank you, Lord. 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 8. We're getting close to the end, y'all. We only got one more after this. One more. Uh, the, the final one. Canon of Scripture. 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 8. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Oh! Well, Mormons, y'all better pay attention. <laughs> right? We see some Mormons out there who are pastors and they got more than one wife. 
How do you get around that? Temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not being a drunkard, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not when I always want to fight, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Alright, so there is a good, it's a good thing to have a pastor. There are certain qualifications that we must uh, maintain and uphold because there is a standard that we are to have amongst uh, everyone. Everyone should look and know, and hey, that you know, my pastor, he don't get out there and get drunk at bars and things like that. He ain't doing that. We should uphold that. And then I've got to say, we can't do this 100% of the time as far as ruling our own house well. As i got to say, you know, some pastors have come across situations where their kids went buck wild. <laughs> and they poured their heart in, into those kids and spanked them every time they could and tried everything they could. But them kids went buck wild. <laughs> and you can't control everyone, but you have to do your best, right? People have to be able to notice, hey, that pastor's at least spanking his kids and disciplining them. And, you know, training them right, keeping them in church, you know, doing all that you can do. But then if when they're 18 and they decide to leave the church, well, that ain't the pastor's fault. Everybody has free will, right? Everybody understands that you can't make somebody do something, you know, because God don't even do that, right? Right. So there has to be some leniency there. So if for some reason, God, please don't let this happen. Brielle goes buck wild and does some crazy <laughs> stuff, you know. That's on her, not on me, all right? <clears throat> so don't run me out of here, because I'm trying my best. I mean, I've, from day one, I've tried to get her to, you know, you know, listen to Bible stories and pray. And uh, even when she was one, she said, Jesus, you know, because I was working with her. I am trying my best. So y'all know that, all right? right? I don't foresee that happening, but, you know, I don't rule anything out, so... God's will be done. I pray that you keep her safe, Lord. And David James. Amen. All right, now we're on the canon of Scripture. And last night, Remy was like, is that really a doctrine, though? I mean, canon of Scripture, that doesn't sound like a doctrine. It is if you consider the different churches that have different Bibles. Oh, yeah. Anybody ever seen a Catholic Bible before? Yeah. They got several books in there that we don't have. You gotta make sure you have the right Bible. The Mormons, they got the whole nother testament of Jesus Christ, you know, all that made up stuff. Then there's also the book of Enoch that is out there. Yes, it's mentioned in the Bible, but it ain't there for a reason. And we don't know about that book of Enoch that's out there because we don't know who wrote every which one and whatever. Because the scholars say that each each chapter was written by somebody different. So I don't know about the book of Enoch that we have today, but there might have been a book of Enoch out there, but for some reason God didn't want to include it. So we need to be okay with that, right? The Bible that we have, the 66 books that we do have, that's our Bible. Amen. All these extras and stuff like that, that ain't for us. Catholics, I'm sorry to tell you, anybody watching at home if you're Catholic, don't use that Bible. Use the 66 books that are canon of Scripture. So yes, it is a doctrine, and God set that particular Bible in for us to read. Now, as we read the Bible, we see that there is a letter written to the Thessalonians. Or, uh, there was a, another letter that we don't have in the Bible. We do have the letters to the Thessalonians. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to... Brother, can you help me back there? I think you... Yeah. He says, I have written a, a letter to... I'm sorry, I, my mind went blank. Please forgive me. There was a letter that was written that we don't have in the Bible. 
It's not in there for a reason. He told them, y'all read this and you send y'alls to them and they'll read that. But we don't have their letter. For whatever reason, we don't have their letter. And that's because God did not want to include it. It's because he said whatever was written in there was something I was going to cover later on or whatever, and it would have been redundant or whatever. Whatever the reason, we don't know. Maybe we'll ask him when we get to heaven. Well, how come the book of Enoch wasn't in there? How come this letter wasn't in there? What would happen? Well, because he'll give us the explanation then. But we don't have it, and that's okay. The 66 books that we do have, that's our Bible. That's what we consider the Word of God. Not anything extra, not all these extra stuff. You know, I wrote a book, it's called Seven Christian Principles, but it's not the Bible. It's got the Bible in it, but it is not the Bible. It is not the Word of God. Now, God may have used me with the Holy Spirit to write things in it, but it is not the Bible. We have the Bible, and that's what we should look to only. Okay? Psalm 12, 6 through 7. Got four more scriptures. The word, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord, you shall preserve them from this generation forever. Amen. Amen. His words are pure. I don't know if you've ever melted something down before. But whenever you melt something down, you're trying to get off the impurities. As a matter of fact, it'll float to the top and you scrape it off and you get it off there. But when you melt it down seven times, man, how pure is that metal then? Whenever you finally go to mold it. It's going to be as pure as it gets. Because you know what seven means? Divine perfection and completeness. Isn't that awesome? That's what God's Word is. He has tried it. He has formed it. He has got it right where He wants it. Not some extra stuff that people want to try to add in that say it's God's Word. But those 66 books that He put there is specifically for us and specifically to fulfill His will and purposes. Amen. You know what you're doing, God. Amen. Matthew 5.18 For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Everything God has in that Bible is going to be fulfilled. Take comfort in that. That also applies to that rapture that's coming. Yeah. Whoo, Lord, I'm ready. Second yeah. Peter 1, 20 through 21 Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any prophet, private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know those things that we see in the Bible? People like to say, well, that was written by a man. Well, guess what? It was by the Holy Spirit in the man that that Bible was written. I take comfort in that, that when I'm reading the Bible, it ain't just a good book. It ain't just some stories that are slammed together. It ain't just a bunch of authors who decided to make up some stuff. But this is the Word of God. So I hold it very in high esteem. I hold it with great reverence. I love it. Amen. If you can't tell. 2 Timothy 3, 14-17. Final Scripture. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. There you go. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let it be so, Lord. Amen. Aren't you glad that you have the Word of God? Yes. Aren't you glad that you get to read the Word of God? Amen. Yes. Please don't consider it as some other ordinary book because it is transformative. It will change your life. It will change your thought process. It will change your speech. 
It will change you from head to toe if you give yourself to it. We'll give one quick little recap here. The seven doctrines were God's nature, salvation, the mission, eschatology, baptisms, church order, and canon of Scripture. Please go back and watch the first video if you didn't watch it. If you don't know how to get to it and you have internet, or you at least have a phone, I can send it in a text, I can send it in your Facebook, I can send it in an email, whatever you have available so you can get caught back up. But I pray that you got something good out of the message today and, and last Sunday as well. I pray that you got some truth. Maybe you didn't understand one of those doctrines or maybe you had a certain view you had on one of those doctrines. Well, maybe that can give you some new enlightenment, some new understanding and wisdom and knowledge because His Word brings that. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I believe we have a, a video up there for our last praise song. <laughs> Amy's looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <clears throat> I think while they try to pull up something, I love studying the Word of God, as if you can't tell. I love His doctrines, but it is very key and very essential that we have the right doctrines. And one thing that we all must do is study it for ourselves. You may not have agreed with something I may have said today. That's okay. Go study it for yourself. Try to see the truth for yourself. And then I pray through the Holy Spirit He will reveal to you truth and I pray that He reveals to me truth. If I'm in error in any way, I pray that He strikes it out of me. And that's what I pray all the time. God, don't let me say something that is false. Don't let me lead them astray in any way, even if by accident. Let me speak what is right. Amen. And I pray that you, you boost me up in prayer with that as well. When In your prayer life, y'all pray as well. God, please give Brandon the right message. Give him the truth. Help him to speak it the right way. Help him not to stumble. Help him not to make a mistake in his words. That he, so that he cannot mislead anybody. Because I don't want to. And I know God doesn't either. Don't you hate it when you're singing along to something, the music drops, and there you are singing? And everybody can hear how bad you are? Well, thank you very much. No need for applause. I'm here all night. Well, I pray y'all got something good from the message today. Uh, if there was something you didn't agree with, I'm sorry. You know, that, that can happen, you know. But do your own studies. You might one day say, well, maybe I do agree with him, you know. Maybe I just didn't study it for myself long enough and I didn't see it, you know. And, but I believe that his doctrine is pure. His yeah. word is pure. And, and when we get close to him, he reveals the truth to us even more and more. So please continue to be students of his word. All through the rest of this week, please continue to study the Bible. Don't let Sundays be the only time you study. Alright? Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we love You and thank You so very much. Thank You for Your, uh, your doctrines, Your truth, Your Word. We appreciate all of it. And we thank You that we get to be here and, and study together, Father, and fellowship together and worship together. We appreciate it. We love You. And we love being in this family. We love that we get to be on Your side. Father, please continue to use us in any way you see fit. And please forgive us for when we make mistakes. Help us to do what's right. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. amen.